Welcome back to this series on uncertainty in deep learning. Last time we had a look at aleatoric uncertainty, which is the uncertainty in the data. Today we'll have a deeper look at three methods to estimate the epistemic uncertainty, so the uncertainty in the model. I hope you enjoy it and don't hesitate to ask questions in the comments. You might have heard of the two ways to interpret probability, frequentism and Bayesianism. The methods we've seen so far were all part of the first category. For frequentists, the probability is defined based on the frequencies of events, and they assume that the data follows some distribution. They ask themselves, given the current model, how likely is it to observe some given data? Therefore, they perform maximum likelihood estimation, and they get a point estimate of the model parameters. Bayesian people, on the other hand, do not only assume that the data follows a distribution, but also the model. Instead of having fixed parameters, the weights are described probabilistically. The second distribution is called the prior and used to model prior knowledge we want to give the model. Bayesian methods have a belief on how the world looks like and then combine this with the observed data. Probability is therefore defined based on the knowledge of events. We will see in a second how we can use Bayes' rule to find both distributions. This optimum is then called maximum a posteriori. We can also sort of connect aleatoric uncertainty with the frequentist approach and epistemic uncertainty with the Bayesian idea. In any case, all of the following methods fall in the Bayesian category and let's now have a look at the first one, which are Bayesian neural networks. The by far most popular method to estimate epistemic uncertainty are Bayesian neural networks. They are out there since the 1990s but got really popular after approaches for more efficient calculations in deep neural networks were presented. In a paper from a group of researchers at Google DeepMind, the method Bayes by Backprop was proposed in 2015. The basic intuition behind modeling epistemic uncertainty is that we need to treat the model parameters not as fixed numbers, but instead probabilistically. In the following we will touch on some theory about Bayesian statistics, and in case you want to learn more about it, I can recommend the online tutorial series Bayesian Methods for Hackers. In BNNs, each individual weight between two neurons is defined as a probability distribution. This can for example be a Gaussian distribution, but also more exotic choices. Learning a distribution on the weights is similar to having an infinite ensemble of networks. When we send data through this network, each of the weights is sampled from their corresponding distribution, and as a result we each time get a different output for the same input. To estimate epistemic uncertainty, we can now simply sample several times and check how much variance we have in the predictions. By capturing epistemic uncertainty, we can learn to express uncertainty about observations, which allows our model to say, I don't know. So this is the high level overview, and now let's talk about it more mathematically. Let's assume we have some data, which is denoted with D, and also a model with learnable parameters theta. We also said that these parameters follow some distribution, so that we can make the neural network stochastic. Of course, we don't know what this distribution is initially, so we make a first assumption, such as the standard normal distribution. This assumption is called the prior. The idea now is to update this prior with our observations. And that's exactly where Bayes' rule kicks in. Bayes' rule helps us to calculate the posterior, so the distribution after observing data. So we update our initial best guess, the prior, each time we observe data from our training data set. A simple example could be that we assume these prior distributions on the weights and then feed in the first data point from our ice cream data set. After observing the true label, we update the weight distributions so that they better match the prediction. According to Bayes' rule, we can calculate this posterior by multiplying the likelihood with the prior, divided by the evidence. Let's ignore the purple term for a second and only focus on this connection. The posterior is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. 
If you've watched the last part, you should be familiar with the likelihood, which is the blue term here. It tells us how likely some data is given our predictions. The yellow term is the prior that is our current weight distribution. Now, if we observe a high likelihood for some data, and in addition to that, a very probable prior for the weights, then this makes the weights pretty good and we also have a very probable posterior distribution. The prior serves in this context as a regularization term and I can recommend a great blog post in case you're interested in more details. The last term in this equation is the evidence or also called marginal probability. You can think of it as some sort of rescaling or normalization based on how likely some specific data is. The problem here, however, is in order to calculate it, we would need to integrate over all possible network parametrizations. And in large networks, there are exponentially many of them. In practice, this is therefore simply not possible. And commonly, the posterior distribution is only approximated instead of its exact inference. There are different ways to approximate the posterior distribution which can be divided into sampling-based and variational methods. The probably most popular approach is called variational inference, which I will explain in more detail here. If you've worked with variational autoencoders before, you're probably already familiar with it. The idea is to learn a simple distribution with new parameters called lambda here, that is as close as possible to the true posterior distribution. So we want to learn these variational parameters to approximate this intractable posterior. In order to optimize for this, we first need a way to compare the two distributions with regards to similarity. This is handled by the KL divergence, which measures the dissimilarity between two distributions. We are, however, still not able to compute this term because the intractable posterior is part of it. The trick here is that by using this approximate distribution, we can get rid of the data likelihood because it does not depend on our variational parameters for which we optimize. If this didn't make sense to you, I've linked a beautiful blog post with a detailed explanation below. Eventually, we end up with this loss function, which is the so-called evidence lower bound or short elbow. It consists of two parts. One is the negative log likelihoods, which makes sure that our predictions are good. And the second one is a regularization term that makes sure that our approximate distribution is close to the prior. The important part is that everything here is with respect to the variational parameters, which means we tweak these little mu's and sigmas and this way come closer and closer to the real posterior distribution. Now, how does this look like in practice? Let's have a look at the process for one single weight between two neurons, which is symbolized by this dumbbell. In the forward pass, we simply sample from the variational distribution that is defined for this specific weight. So if we have a normal distribution, our variational parameters are mu and sigma. This sampling gives us a weight value, just like in a regular deterministic network, and with this single weight, we can proceed as usual, which means we calculate the activations until the final layer and obtain a loss value for the elbow loss function. In order to update our variational parameters, we then perform backpropagation. The special part here now is that we cannot backpropagate through a random node. A solution to that is called the reparametrization trick, which decouples the sampling from the actual network. The sampling now takes place in a separate distribution outside of the network and we can include this randomness by multiplying it with the standard deviation and adding the mean of the weight distribution. This way the gradients can easily flow through our network and no random node needs to be passed. And this is more or less the full approach how we can fit Bayesian neural networks using variational inference. Now, this was all about BNNs in this theory part. In the next video, we will look at the implementation for our data set. BNNs are a great tool for estimating epistemic uncertainty, but of course, setting distributions on the weights also comes with downsides. The most obvious one is that the computational cost is much higher compared to a regular neural network. 
Not only the training takes longer, but also inference is slower because you have to sample several times. In a paper from 2015 called Dropout as Bayesian Approximation, it was shown that we can simply use Dropout to approximate the results of Bayesian neural networks. This allows us to train the models more efficiently while still obtaining an estimate of the epistemic uncertainty. Dropout is a technique that randomly drops out units from the network. This can be done by sampling a random binary mask that is applied in each layer. The results are several subnetworks of the original network. Usually we use dropout during training to avoid overfitting and turn it off at prediction time because we want to use all information that's available. The trick with Monte Carlo dropout is now that we also apply random dropouts at prediction time and sample several forward iterations for an input. For each of these predictions we have a different subset of parameters which allows to capture the variance. It can be shown that Monte Carlo dropout is an approximation to the Bayesian posterior. Now there is not much more to say about it because it's a straightforward and easy to implement solution for estimating epistemic uncertainty. You can even parallelize the sampling at prediction time and with that it's a very scalable approach. The variance in the predictions then expresses the epistemic uncertainty in the model. MCD can also be seen as an ensemble of different networks with shared weights. Now what we of course can also do is to have an ensemble of networks with separate weights. This brings us to the next method called deep ensembles. Deep ensembles are simply an ensemble of neural networks that are trained independently. At prediction time their outputs are simply averaged. It can be seen like a set of experts and whenever these experts share the same opinion for an input we are very certain and if their opinions are different we report high uncertainty. Ensemble approaches are often the best performing methods in Kaggle competitions and no wonder that deep ensembles also work extremely well. In a paper from 2019, deep ensembles were studied with respect to their loss landscape. By using many neural networks, it is possible to explore many valleys in the loss landscape, which makes the model extremely robust. Effectively, deep ensembles are also an approximation of the Bayesian posterior. I'll link another great article in case you're interested. To get out the best performance, the individual models should be trained with different hyperparameters and different datasets. Of course, deep ensembles also have high computational costs, but you can, just like with Monte Carlo dropout, parallelize the computations. Congratulations, you have just finished the theoretical part of this uncertainty in deep learning series. We had a look at Bayesian neural networks, Monte Carlo dropout, as well as deep ensembles in this video. Besides the models we've captured so far, there are of course many other interesting approaches that can be found in the literature. If you dig deeper, you will also find many more theoretical connections between the models, but all of this just didn't fit into this short video series. In the next and last part, we will eventually look at some implementations of these methods and we'll see how we can make our neural network tell us I don't know. So as always, thank you for watching and see you soon in the next part.